Well, I grew up in Southern California. I grew up in uh, Newport Beach, Huntington Beach area, and that's where I grew up as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult. That was the culture I lived in. I married a Michigan girl, and at one point we moved to West Michigan to a little town called Byron Center, a town that had one street light in it, in the entire town, so a small town. And if you don't think that uh, there's more than one culture in America, you miss something, because there's hundreds of cultures in America. And if you don't, Huntington Beach, California, and Byron Center, Michigan, I'm here to tell you, it's not just a different culture, not just a different state, it's a different world. And I walked into that, and I found out that they even said things and had words and stuff that they all understood what it meant, and I didn't. And there were times they had to say, excuse me, um, I don't know what you're talking about, or I don't know what you mean. So, so when I began, and this is the first time, I've only been a senior pastor at two churches, at Corinth Reformed Church in Byron Center, Michigan, and a Shoreline Church. I, I, when I called somewhere, I pretty much stay there until God tells me it's time to go somewhere else. And so I was there for many, many years. But when I first started working there, I remember Barb, who was the office manager of the church, she was talking to me one day. She said, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, our kids this summer, they'll be working in the muck fields. And uh, when, I, when we were younger, we worked in the muck fields. This is kind of part of what you do when you're young here. You work in the muck fields. And I said, uh, Barb, what's a muck field? I didn't know what she was talking about. She said, well, you know when you drive down 100th Avenue, those, those farm areas, it's just the dark, dark, you know, dirt. He said, that's the muck fields. And, it's kind of, and she said, when, it's kind of a thing here when kids are growing up, they, they work in the muck fields for two or three summers. Hard, hard physical labor. This isn't 16, 17, 18 year olds. Sometimes it's 13, 14, 15 year olds. Working long days in the muck fields. And here's what I discovered listening to Barb, hearing her talk about this, hearing about this generational thing. There was this sense that this is a really good thing for these young people to be out there working hard, physical labor. Maybe it's one of those things that caused them to say, I don't want to spend the rest of my life working in the muck fields. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, you know, but, but, but. There was a sense that that's, that was the way they lived their lives. And, it was, and, and generationally, they kept doing that. And, and look, my wife, Sherry, she didn't work in the muck fields, but she worked in the, in the blueberry fields for hours a day, picking out the twigs and things. And, just, you know, and her mom worked in the rusk factory, which I don't know if you know what rusk is. I had to look that one up too. It's like thin-cut bread that's cooked twice, so it's basically like stale bread. But, but there's, there's this, there was this sense that... Working hard, as soon as you're able to work, and doing something physical, cre- you know, just creating something, doing something, farming something, nurturing, that there's this, like, there's this, this good gift. And I know where that comes from. If you have a Bible, look with me in the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the second chapter, Genesis chapter 2. And in Genesis chapter 2, whether you're on your, your iPad or your phone or whether you have your Bible, we'll have it on the screens as well. There's this picture, God is, you know, God is creating, God is making, and there's this picture of perfect paradise. Genesis 2, remember in the Bible, sin shows up, and paradise is lost, paradise is broken in chapter 3 of Genesis. So this is still perfect paradise. God's design, God is designing the absolute perfect Eden, Edenic paradise, and here's where we read in Genesis 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man... And put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Hard work, nurturing, to work it and take care of it. This is paradise. And there's work. When you picture paradise, do you picture work? (laughs) Or do you picture a hammock, an eternal hammock, you know? But, but, but this is the picture that, that's painted for us in Genesis chapter 2. And Adam and Eve are both called to labor. Pain and labor only came after the fall. And Adam's labor would become painful and Eve's labor would become painful. But in Genesis chapter 2, it's still perfect paradise and there's a sense of working, of producing, of doing something. Now turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, there's this kind of umbrella picture that I think, I remember as a, as a brand new Christian, someone gave me a Bible, said this is God's word, it's really important, you're supposed to read it, so I read it, and I remember this the first time I read it, and it did something inside of me. It adjusted the way I looked at the work I do. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 says this, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart, as working for the Lord as working for the one who gave his life on a cross for you. Not for human masters. It's not about your boss. It's not about who's in charge. 
It's not about who's looking over your shoulder. At the end of the day, the work you do, the work I do, it is for the Lord. And as, as I thought about this, I, re, I, remember, uh, I remember working in the freezer at 7-Eleven, stocking the freezer. And it's like, I'm going to stock the freezer for Jesus, man. I'm going to stock the Budweiser and the cores for Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. A little too enthusiastic on some of your part. But, but, uh, but you know, it's like, I'm, I'm going to do it, and the Pepsi and the Coke. I'm going to stock the freezer for Jesus. When I worked at Munchie's Pizza. It was a pizza place where you actually, you made the dough. I was in charge of like, like spinning it and putting on a little show. Can you imagine me entertaining people, right? But I'm putting it on a show, making the pizzas and kind of, and I, but I tossed those pizzas for Jesus. Brand new Christian, I'm, re, I'm reading the Bible. I'm like, do it, do it. And I, I'm going to do it all for the Lord. When I became a youth pastor, when I was still in college, when I became a youth pastor, I tried to love those kids and teach them about Jesus for the sake of Jesus. I didn't do it for their parents. I didn't do it for Mel DeVries and, 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 and Rich. I didn't do it for Mel and Rich, who were the two pastors. I did it for Jesus. And you know what? I think I was a better youth pastor because I was working for Jesus than I was for, working for Mel or Rich. I cared about them. I respected them. But man, when I'm working for Jesus, I'm trying to give everything. And I've been pastor here for over 12 years now. And can I tell you something? At the end of the day, I'm not ultimately doing what I'm doing for you as much as I love you. I'm doing it for Jesus. And be glad. Because I don't think I'd work as hard if it was just for you. <laughs> I love you, but I, I, I just know that, that when I wake up in the morning, I have the privilege of serving Shoreline Church in Monterey, California, and pouring myself out and working hard for the body of Christ that Jesus loved, that he cares about, and that he leads. See, Shoreline Church exists to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. He's the Lord of the church. He's the head of the church. But that also means if you're a school teacher, you're pointing to those kids for Jesus. If you have a trash, a trash truck that you run and you have a trash route, you're picking up that trash and you're getting rid of it and you're taking care of it for Jesus. And if you're in the military, if you're in education, if you're, if you're in the hospitality business, if, you're, you, if you work in a restaurant, if, you, if you're busing tables, you bus it for Jesus. If you're serving people, you serve them for Jesus. Everything. If you're a student, and your vocation right now is that you're, stu you're, stu you're studying, you're learning, and that's, that's your, kind of your full-time gig, then do it for Jesus. And it can change everything. That's the heartbeat that we see here. And then there's one more passage I want to look at. This one's a little bit longer, and this may be a passage, even if you've been in church a lot through your life, maybe for years and years or decades, you may not have heard anybody preach on this passage. But we're going to walk through this passage together, and I want you to hear. It's a passage, it's kind of a strange passage, because Paul is talking to the church at Thessalonica, and he's giving them some very clear guidelines on how they do their community life together. And he's addressing the topic of work, hard work. So look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and I'm going to begin in verse 6. And just get the heartbeat of what the Apostle Paul is saying to this church. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, this is a big deal, it's not a suggestion, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every Christian, every believer who is idle and disruptive. Who's idle, lazy, doesn't do anything, and disruptive. Now you're going to find at different times, even in this passage, when, when someone's idle, it also mentions being disruptive together. Why? Because when you have nothing to do, you find something to do. And usually what you find to do is not a good thing to do. Right? So he says, be careful, watch out for those people, you avoid those people, uh, keep away from every believer who is idle and disruptive, and listen to this, and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. So the Apostle Paul is saying, we've taught you as a church how to conduct yourselves, how to behave. And so he's going to clarify what it is he's taught them, he's reminding them of what he's already taught them. Verse 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Okay, so now we're going to pay attention, what's he mean by follow our example, Right? We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. Now, Paul was a tent maker. He, he was a craftsman, and he worked a full-time job making tents, and he traveled around the world planting churches and writing letters to those churches. He was bivocational. He worked as a tent maker, and he worked as a church starter, a church planter. And he said, when we came to town, we didn't make you carry the freight for us. We didn't make you, you know, we, we, we paid our own way. We would, nor would we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, listen to this. 
We work. Here's, this is the example he's saying that they should follow, that, that people in the church should follow. He said, okay, um, we don't want to be a burden to you. Uh, we, oh, let me say, he said, on the, uh, the end, second half of verse 8. On the contrary, he says, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. You hear what Paul's saying? We worked hard, day and night, laboring, toiling. Why? Because we didn't want you to carry the burden for us. We carried our own burden. We did this, verse 9 says, not because we do not have the right to such help. In other words, he said, because we're serving you, because we're doing this ministry, we could ask for help, but we wanted to give a model for you. But in order to offer ourselves as a model for you to imitate, this is the way that Christians should live. For even when we were with you, and here's the one that challenges people, but you got to hear this. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. This is a rule for the church. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Now people go, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. That's cruel. That's mean. That's terrible. He doesn't say the one who is unable to work. The one who's unwilling to work. Right? You following that? See, when, some, when someone's unable to work, Christians are the first ones in line to help them. We should be, always. We should be the most compassionate, the most generous, the most caring. This is why we, we do food services around our community. This is why we have a food pantry here, clothing clock. I mean, we, we're helping people who are really in need. But the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. Don't let that upset you. That was actually the rule for the church then, and I believe it should be the rule for the church now. Because the Bible doesn't change. If someone says, I don't want to, I don't care, I'm not going to do anything. He says, well then, you know, then you'll take care of yourself. You're making a choice. Verse 11. We hear that some among you are, now he's talking to the specific church. He's talking, give general teaching. Now we hear that some around you who are idle and disruptive. Again, nothing to do, getting yourself in trouble. They are, and I love this line. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. You get that? They're not busy doing something productive, so they're busy just getting in trouble, right? Such people we command and urge. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is serious. To settle down and eat the f- uh, and earn the food they eat. Get to work. Earn some income. Take care of yourself. If you can, do it. And as for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what is good. I don't know if you've ever heard this passage preached on. But it's an important passage. Now, you need to understand something also. We plan our services more than a year in advance. I'm just finishing up all of the Sundays of services, preaching biblical texts and themes for 2022. Our team already has them. So this topic was laid out about, about 17 months ago. But God's timing is great because this is the time that I think that, that there's, a forgot, there's a lost art, a forgotten art to really working hard. So let me just give you some observations from these different passages and some things that kind of get your heart and your mind around. First, the Bible's clear. Some people are idle and disruptive, kind of lazy and troublemakers. And this is not what God wants for us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you should not be a person who's idle, who's lazy, who's just kind of sitting around and just kind of wasting your time or getting in trouble. But, but God has something more planned for you. We also hear that Paul and his ministry team said, you need to follow our example. We're working hard. We're pouring it out day and night, laboring, striving. There is something absolutely beautiful and wonderful in the gift of working hard. That working hard, if, again, if in paradise, God said to Adam and Eve, do some work, do some labor, then, then there's something good in this. There's a gift that God offers to us if we're willing to receive it. And then you notice there's a rule in the church. And it's interesting because I think some people would think this is just cruel. To say if a person's unwilling to work, they shouldn't eat. That's just mean-spirited. That's just cruel. Well, pause for a minute and think about it. Is that really cruel? If you're a parent and you have a child who's 14, 15, 16, I don't want to do anything. 18, 19, 20. Oh, no, I don't want to do anything. Just take care of me. You and everybody else in the world just take care of me. 25, 27, 30, 35. Is, is it loving and caring to let someone just kind of cruise through life and never do anything productive with their life? I, don't, I, I think that God is the most loving being in the universe. So when his word gives us guidelines, we might go, well, it might not be the way our culture works right now. It might not be the way I see it. But wait a minute. Maybe God has something going on here. Maybe God understands how he's made us. I think God has made us to do productive things, to find opportunities to work. And sometimes that work is paid work. Sometimes that work is volunteering. 
you know, when you, when you come to worship right now, it's 11 o'clock, the worship team up here, there's usually one person, maybe two that are staff. Everyone else is a volunteer. They were here at the 9 o'clock service. They were here practicing before the 9 o'clock service. They were here at about 6 in the morning, this morning, to, to lead you into the presence of Jesus. And all those volunteers, they're not paid for this. They're working for the Lord. It's not always a paid job. It's just living your life. You, you might volunteer with SPCA. You might volunteer with, with an orphan ministry, you know, ministry or just an organization in Monterey that helps people in need. And, and you're working, you're serving, you're making a difference. And God says, I delight in that. He's made us to create and to do things that have meaning and purpose. And so I, when I think about our worship leaders here, by the time they're done, they'll, they'll finish this service. They'll be cleaning up their gear and finishing up. And, and some of them will be still here wrapping things up when you're off having lunch somewhere. And to get here at 6 in the morning, they were probably up at 4.30 so they could be here and serve you. Why do people do that? Why would anyone do that for free? Because they, they use their gifts, who they are. They do things that are productive for the glory of God and for the blessing of others. And there's joy and there's delight in that. I also want you to notice that, that, uh, that this discussion that the Apostle Paul opens up is, is the issue that these people are unwilling to work. And, if, and he says, if somebody's unwilling to work, then they haven't earned their keep. And again, I want to say, if somebody is unable, if somebody is incapacitated, that's different. But if somebody's unwilling, the Apostle Paul says, in the church, there's consequences. You don't just keep carrying them and carrying them if they're not willing to carry their own weight. It's not an act of love for them. What you do with your time matters. How you use your life matters. And so we're called, we're urged to understand that God created this great gift of work and, and we're going to, right now, we're going to walk through these five movements that were in, the, in, this, in this Forgotten Art series. There's a kind of five movements that look at kind of how God designed it, where we are today, and how do we reclaim the good gifts God has. And so, so the first movement in this series that we've been going through for the past weeks and will be for the next couple of weeks is the Master Artist Plan. Movement one is the Master Artist Plan. And when you read Genesis, you realize God's plan was to give us meaningful work to do. To, to do things that we could grow to love. And, and you know what? The, the idea of doing all things for Jesus and finding meaningful work, I've had times along the way where the jobs I've had weren't my personal preference or choice. But you can make a decision with whatever work you do where you're going to pour yourself into it and you're going to give the, the best you can to it. I, I love, I love encountering people who are doing very simple jobs with all their heart with a joyful spirit. And when I see that, I'll almost always just stop and talk with them. And just say, you know, I'm watching what you're doing and how you're, I just, I, I see, I see so much, you know, dignity and goodness and beauty in, in how you do your work. I've had that conversation with people at fast food places where somebody answers instead of going, yeah, what do you want? You know, it's, hey, how you doing? And, you, and it's not just like the script there, there's a joy. And then you, you pull up the window and they're like friendly and kind. I asked, I asked a young woman at a, at, at a place one time, I said, am I allowed to tip you? Because I was so impressed by her spirit and her attitude. And she says, no, they have cameras. And if you give me any money, I don't put it in the, in the thing, I'm in trouble. So you, you, we can't take tips. And I said, then can I tell you something? And she said, sure. And I said to her, you know what? I, said, I, I travel around the world and train leaders all over the world. I said, you are an example of leadership. You are an example of a great attitude. I said, what, I said, whatever you do in your life, you will succeed if you keep this attitude and if you keep working the way you work. And she just lit up. Like a light, but probably a better tip than if I gave her money. Although she probably would have liked the money too. But it wasn't, it wasn't allowed. But, but stop and notice that and see that God has a vision. And that vision is that we would enjoy labor. Enjoy the work we do. And so Adam and Eve were invited into this. God has made us to be productive. You know, if you, what's, God's, what's God's plan? To enjoy your work. To be productive. To create things. And then in a sense, to, to follow the example of the God who made us and loves us. Our God is a creator. No one's more creative than our God. Our God created the universe. He sustains it. Jesus, when he walked on this earth for 30 years, he worked in a carpenter shop. Jesus traveled and preached, and he gave his life on the cross. He took our sins. There's nobody who gave more than Jesus, served more than Jesus, worked harder than Jesus. He left the glory of heaven for you and me. We follow his example. Not to be idle and lazy, but to give ourselves to whatever, he, whatever doors he opens up to us. And I think there's also a picture here in God's plan that the road to one of the spiritual markers is paved by hard work. One of our seven spiritual markers that the Bible talks about is joyful generosity. You know how you can become joyfully generous? Have something to share. Have something to give. Work hard. And then share what God gives you with others. Share it with the work of Jesus. 
Years ago, Sherry and I, in the, in the other church, the other church uh, where I was a lead pastor years ago, we did a big, a big. We built a new worship center and a new student uh, ministry center, an office complex, and uh, and uh, and just built, you know, built a whole new facility. And, and we were going to come to the congregation and ask them to pray about giving towards this new project. But Sherry and I knew we had to pray first. And because we had to commit what we were going to give first before we could ask the board to give, before we could ask the staff to give, we had to make our commitment. So I spent time praying about it, and I, was just, I came up with kind of a number that I thought we could afford to give. And then I, in prayer, God put on my heart, and that's not enough, you've got to give more, so I increased it. And then later on when I prayed with our elders, uh, I felt like God said, you've got to give more, I increased it again. And then a fourth time, God actually told me, four times God told me more, 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 to the point where God put on my heart was more than we had in our savings, in the boys' school savings. It was everything we had, and then it was more. So then I had to go to Sherry and ask her to pray about it so that we could kind of come in line. So I asked Sherry, would you pray about what we should give towards this thing? And she said, well, I've already been praying. I knew you were going to ask me. And the other day I was running. She's always on the cul-de-sac over there running. And God put on my heart how much we should give. And it was the exact same amount. See, God had to get, work me over four times to get me there. And God just told her once, and she's like, okay, that's, that's Sherry and I, right? Um, but, but that's what we committed to give. But when we com- so we, we made the commitment to the church. We would give that amount. And we knew we didn't have the money. And then... About a week later, a knock on our door. I open it. There's a bag on our porch full of all the money we needed. No, it didn't happen. Um, that's not what happened. Um, a couple weeks later, Zondervan Publishing contacted us, contacted us and said, hey, we've got this project called the Old Testament Challenge. It's about an 18-month to two-year project. It was going to mean about 20 to 30 hours a week between the two of us every week on top of our full-time work. That was how God answered our prayer. We worked an extra 30 hours a week between the two of us on top of serving the church. And by the end of the time, we could pay all that we had committed. And you know what? That was more of a miracle from God. I would have liked the bag of money on the porch. That would have been cool. (laughs) But that's not, God said, no, work harder. But when we gave that money, month by month by month, we had the sense of we're part of the work of God. That this is an honor. This is a privilege. And we got to work harder. That, that, that's the heart of God. That's the vision. So here's a question for you. And I want you, to be, I want you to ponder this. I want you to chew on this question a little bit, okay? Do you see work as a gift and a privilege or just an unwanted chore? Ask yourself, do you think of work as a gift and a privilege or something you just have to do and get out of the way? Because I believe God designed us to have meaning and purpose, to help others. The folks who came up here and led in worship today, they put that, that, all the time they put in today, they also practiced at home. They can say, well, they got paid nothing for doing that. No, they got paid a lot. The blessing of watching you come into the presence of the living God. That's a privilege. That's a joy. When you teach children, it's a blessing. When you toss a good pizza, make it maybe some jalapenos and pineapple. You ever try that? Oh. Um, and you, 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 whatever you do, do it for the Lord and know it's a blessing and a privilege. Is that your outlook? Movement number two, the forgotten art. So we know God's vision is that God has made us to find joy and pleasure in doing things that are productive and that bring him honor. But movement number two, the, the forgotten art. You know, things have changed. Um, it, it, things have changed. You know, I don't know if there's many kids working in the muck fields anymore. Working in the blueberry fields. You know, culture has changed, and, and, and I don't know if there's the same attitude, the same perspective. There was a time when, when a hard day of work was prized. When people say, man, we're working hard, pouring themselves out, getting done at the end of the day, just going, man, I gave it everything I had. Whether, whether it's bent back labor or whether it's bent over a computer type of stuff and doing engineering and creating, whatever it is, to, to work hard, things have changed. And I don't know if people have that same outlook and that same disposition. Things have changed. There's a forgotten art. People used to respect someone who worked hard, not just someone who made a lot of money. Remember that? When you see, just they respected the fact that somebody worked hard at what they did. And, and there was an honor for that. And now it seems like the honor is more if you make a lot of money. But man, if you do what you do the best you can with all your heart, that brings pleasure to God and it should bring joy to us. Here's a question for you. Do we see hard work as honoring to God and character building? Do you look at a hard day of work, working hard, volunteering here, pouring into your children and raising your children and, 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 and pour, investing in their lives, doing the work you've been called to do? do? If you're a student, giving the best you can, do you, do you look at that labor, that work, at what you do as something that honors God, 
Do you know that God takes pleasure when he sees you giving your best to what you do? And also it builds character in us. There's something that happens in us when we work hard. There's something that happens in our hearts and our lives. My little sister, Lisa, uh, my, my, my parents sort of had two families. Uh, they, had, they, had, they had Alice and Gretchen and Kevin, and they stopped having kids. And then they, they had a diaphragm baby. No, they had an IUD baby and a vasectomy baby. I'm looking at one of our OBGYNs. They, they, they had an a, a IUD baby and a vasectomy. If, if you have questions, talk to Dr. Rick after the service. And a vasectomy baby. And, but same parents, nine and ten years later, two more kids. Surprise, surprise. Uh, but but um, my, my, uh, my little sister, Lisa, moved into the, into the world of moving people from unemployment to employment. Right out of college. That was what she studied. That's what she focused on. That's what she's devoted her life to. And when she got out of college, she worked with three... She started a, 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 a Christian-based business called WorkNet Solutions where she was helping three kinds of people move from unemployment to employment. She picked three of the hardest groups in all of American culture. Here's what she started working with. Women coming out of second and third generation uh, welfare homes, women coming out of prison, and women coming out of prostitution and trying to get a real job. That's who my sister worked with. Poured her life into that. She still does that. She's written a couple of books about this topic, and she moves people from unemployment to employment. And I remember when my sister Lisa was, so she's talked to me a lot about this through the years, and I ask her what she's doing at different times, and it's always fascinating. But at one point she said, she said she was speaking to a group, of, she does national conferences, and she's been in international conferences to people that move people to employment. And she said, um, she was talking about entitlements. And she said, and she said, she said this whole big group of people, she said, I'm going to talk to you about some entitlements for your clients. And everybody kind of sits up and perks up. Like, oh, because they want more, enti- more things we can give to our people, right? And she says, they're entitled to get off their couch and go to work. <laughs> That's my little sister. And she, she's, she's tall for the women in my family. She's about this tall, Lisa is. And so the women in my family are about that tall. And uh, the family I grew up in. But, but, she, but, but she, because she understood that... Um, that, that, that God brings dignity through work. That God blesses people through the work that they do. So movement number three, the picture is marred. We have to realize that some, something's gone wrong. Uh, something in our, our whole thinking, and the thinking in the world today is something that my sister's been fighting against for years. So here's one thing that's gone wrong. It's what I call the, endang- the danger of entitlement thinking. The danger of, en- I, I'm entitled to this, I'm entitled to this, I'm entitled to this for, for, for doing nothing. I just, I, just, I just want more and more and more things for doing nothing. And my sister would tell you, there's few things more damaging to people than to not give them the dignity of work. Few things more damaging. My sister believes that actually moving people from unemployment to employment is a gift from God and is a ministry. And there was an entire country that asked if they could use her resources for a national program of moving people from unemployment to employment because her her system is so effective. But it's, it's, it's based on the Bible. It's based on the dignity of human beings and that God's made us to work. And so this country asked, could they use it? But they wanted to actually take out all of the Christian, distinctively Christian things. And she said, no, it doesn't work. Because you have to have that fundamental sense that there is a God who has made us and our work is valuable. And this entire country is now using her resources with the Christian. It's a very country that's not strongly Christian at all. But they're using her, her resources for training people because it's effective and it's effective because it's based on scripture. And there's this understanding of the value and the dignity of hard work. And Lisa's told me so many stories, and I've read, I've read two of her books and read different stories, but she told this one story about this um, woman who was coming, I, I think she was coming either out of prison or out of prostitution. She'd never had a real job, and she got a job, and she came to Lisa after her first paycheck. And she showed her the, she showed her the check, this woman did, the check, and she pointed to the taxes they took out of her, out of her thing, and she started crying. <laughs> She's just pointing the tax. And then my sister Lisa, she said, I know it's hard. That's part of the deal. We all pay taxes. And she says, no, I'm not crying because I took my taxes. I'm crying because now finally I'm doing something to help other people in need like I was. This woman's tears were that she was finally contributing to help other people. That's dignity. That's the grace of God. That's God's design. And that God, that's God's plan. I think we also... Uh, see this, the picture being marred and the, and the sense of the goodness of work and, and that it's a gift from God being marred because I think that there's, there's, in our culture now, the sin of laziness is not seen as a sin. The sin of laziness, you, you read through the book of Proverbs. There, there's a word that Proverbs uses in the NIV for people who just are lazy all the time and don't try to do anything hard and any labor. It's called a sluggard. You ever heard that in the word Sluggard. It says, the sluggard does this. The sluggard. Do a study in Proverbs sometime, the book of Proverbs, on the sluggard. It's not a pretty picture. 
God does not present the sluggard, the person who never wants to work and do anything, in a positive light. But those who work hard and provide and do their part. In our culture, there seems to be a movement towards taking the easy route and cutting corners. What's the easiest way I can get through doing this with the least hassle for me? The path of least resistance. And I think sometimes with, with our kids, if we're not careful and our grandkids, I'm not saying they've got to go work in the muck fields, but there's something about teaching them how to work hard from the time they're young, to do their part, to contribute, and to, and to really and to see that as a gift from the living God. And I want to share something very pastoral with you, and I believe this, and I think this is, this is one of the reasons that things are changing in our world. When you are in a time of need, anytime we're in a time of need, we should always look to God first. I'm thankful that there's governmental support for people. I think that's great. But sometimes we look to government before God. Let's look to God and say, God, how would you have me live and how would you have me be? And that could change your whole disposition, your whole outlook. Some people don't look to like God first and then government or government first. They just look to government, period. And it, what it just, God, I look to you. I cry out to you. I ask for your leading, for your guidance. How would you have me live? How would you have me handle the situation? And look to God first above everything else. So a question for you. Why do so many people want something for nothing and only do the minimal they can to get away with it? Why, why is it in our world, in our culture, that there's, there's so much, what's the most I can get for doing the least? Or maybe I can get the most for doing nothing. And, and where, how does God's heart look at that? I can't speak for the world. As a pastor, I don't speak for the world. But I can speak for the church, and I can speak for the word of God, and I can speak for followers of Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we should not be content doing nothing and getting something as a lifestyle. Maybe for a moment in a time of struggle where you need help, great. But God would want you to get back on your feet and step into the world and contribute and offer something. Even if it's something simple and not that, that, that doesn't get a lot of praise from other people, but doing your part to make a difference. Movement number four. Now we kind of move back to the kind of reclaiming and seeing how do we live in a way that honors God. Movement number four, reclaiming God's good gift. I believe as Christians we need to teach a work ethic in the home and model it. We need to model it, and a lot of parents will model it, but they're not necessarily teaching it. And my family growing up, growing up was kind of funny. On a refrigerator, and this is before Lisa and Jason were born, when we were, so we were still, Allison and Gretchen and myself were still younger, but on our refrigerator there was a big kind of a chart, and on the chart had three columns, and each of the three columns was all the chores that needed to be done in the house and in the yard and cooking. And there were three lists, and then there were magnets that said Allison, Gretchen, and Kevin. And they just, each week the magnet got changed, and those were your chores for the week. And then you got a little allowance if you did your chores. If you didn't get your chores, you got something else. And it wasn't an allowance. You got in trouble. Uh, that, but my parents weren't Christians as I was growing up. But they taught us the beauty and the gift of work. I had to learn how to cook and do yard work and do housework and to vacuum. I love vacuuming. There's something very soothing about vacuuming. I don't know if they, I'm not coming to your house and doing it, but I mean, I love the, the patterns and the carpet. Anyways, that's just, that's probably a counseling session for me. But I love, I, you know, but, but there's, you know, that was part of, what, what I grew up with. And I thank God for that. We should teach it to the next generation. We should teach a work ethic in the church and model it in the church. Of all people who work hard, people in the church ought to work hard. Because, and I tell our staff this at times. I tell them, what they get paid is the gifts of God's people. I don't get a paycheck. Nobody in our church gets a paycheck. We don't have, we don't have any subsidies coming in from anywhere else. We do have one tower on the roof and we get something from some telephone company, some... some uh, we get some fee per, not fee, we get a little check per month. But otherwise, all we have is, is your gifts. And so I, I make sure as the lead pastor that all of our staff members are working really hard. And they want to work hard, but we, we make sure we're working smart and hard and fruitfully for God's glory, but also to honor the fact that you all are generous. And when you give, it's going to keep this church moving forward. I think we need to celebrate hard work. How do, how do we kind of, kind of reclaim this? We've got to start, when you, when you see somebody working hard, Will you just stop and for one minute walk over to them and say, thank you so much. If you're in a restaurant right now, at this time, the person, the person who's bringing your food to you or who's busting the tables, they could be making almost as much staying at home and not working, but they're not. They are showing up every day and working. Thank them. Look them right in the eyes and say, thank you. I'm watching how hard you work. It means so much. And if you're a tipper, you know, double the tip. Because... 
that's the way you bless people. You know, celebrate. If you see your kids working hard, celebrate it. Your grandkids working hard, celebrate it. A friend, a colleague working hard, celebrate that. Affirm that. I'm going to share one more thought about this idea of reclaiming God's good gift. And this is something that's become something in our culture. I, I want to just give you two pictures, and I want to address something that's going on in our world that I think it's important as Christians that we have a biblical worldview, a biblical mindset. So I'm going to give you two scenarios. I want you to imagine two different people, all right? Here's the first person. It's a young woman who's gotten married. She's a Christian woman, gotten married, fallen in love, had one child, two children, three children. And then her husband has a massive heart attack. She's now a single mom with three little kids. She works in an office role as an admin eight hours a day, getting family and friends and cobbling together childcare so she can provide for her family. And when the kids are at bed at night, she has somebody who comes over to keep an eye on them, and she works a four hour shift cleaning offices so she can take care of her family. And she earns a living enough to get by. Now, I want you to picture another person a young guy, he's 25, 26 years old, doesn't want to work, got a college degree, doesn't want to work. He wants his family and his friends and Uncle Sam to meet all his needs. And he's getting paid almost as much for those sources as this woman is as she's trying to care for her family, raise her kids, and work in a job and a half. How do you think God views that? People will say, well, well, you know, is that fair? There's nothing fair about that. And so I'm going to use two terms with you right now, and I want to try to clarify something that I believe as Christians we have to understand this. As Christians, we should believe there should be absolute equality of opportunity. Every one man, every man, woman, every ethnic background, every single human being should have an equal opportunity to succeed, to work. We should not put any barriers for anyone having an opportunity to thrive. Equality of opportunity. But this term, equality of outcome, everyone should end up with the same. Biblically, no, they shouldn't. Someone who's unwilling to work in the church wasn't going to have dinner. Somebody said, well, no, everyone should, should, that this woman and this guy, the, the equality of outcome, the outcome, everyone gets the same outcome no matter what they do. And biblically, no, that's not, that's not the way we live our lives. Whatever culture says, whatever the world says. Equality of opportunity, let's make sure we, make, give, we put no barriers for anyone to have an equal opportunity to thrive, to succeed, to work hard, to enjoy life. Equality of outcome is not a biblical concept. It's not realistic and it's not just and it's not fair. And our God is the God of justice. This woman who's working a job and a half and pouring herself out to work that way and have somebody else get given the same amount for doing nothing and spending their day playing video games and watching Netflix... Something's wrong. That's not a biblical model. As a pastor, I want us to think biblically and then let that interact with how our cultural views are and make sure you design your thinking and your life around what Scripture teaches. So a question for you. Do you believe that Christians should be the hardest and most committed people in the workplace? Do you believe that if you're in the workplace, whatever your role is, whether you're, whether you're spinning pizzas at Munchie's Pizza, whether you're stocking the 7-Eleven 7, 7 freezer, whether you're a youth pastor, whether you're, you know, do, do you believe that, that Christians should be the hardest and most committed people in their workplace? We sh- I do. We should be the first to show up. We should be the last to leave. We should be the ones where somebody else is struggling, going, hey, can I help you with that? How can I help you in that? So, no, that's not my department. That's not my job description. I'm out of here. And we can have a witness in our world right now. Like I said, this sermon uh, was planned Almost, almost a year and a half ago in terms of being today. But it's a very timely moment in our world. And Christians, we need to not only be in them, in, you know, out there working, using our gifts, using our abilities, but we should be the ones that people look at and say, man, she, it just goes after it. She is amazing. She gives 100% all the time and then some more. Man, that guy just, just goes for it. Whatever the environment is, whether you're a student, whether you're, you're raising kids and you're at home, whether you're in the workplace, we should be giving our best and be a model. And then movement number five. Becoming an artist. Becoming an artist. How do we live this out in a way that honors God? Just a few thoughts. Follow God's call and follow the example of Jesus. Jesus gave everything. He gave it all. Let's do the same. Teach young people to work hard. Give them opportunities to succeed. Give them opportunities to fail. But give them a chance to work hard. 
Beware of giving too much and making life too easy. If we're going to raise a generation of young people that know what it is to work hard, be careful you don't give them everything. But let them learn what it is to earn things. That's, that's just good practice. It used to be pretty normal, and the world has changed. It may get the point down the line where we can't give kids too much because there's not a lot to give to go around. But right now, there's still plenty, it seems, to go around. So be careful you don't give. There, there, there's a term, when helping hurts. Right? When you help too much, it actually hurts someone by helping them too much. Don't overhelp the next generation. Help them learn to work hard. Model hard work. Be an example for other people. Serve your neighbors. Serve your friends. See, a lot of the work we do isn't paid work. If you're retired, do you know some of the people I know that are retired, they will say to me, I've never worked harder in my life. I'm helping out with grandkids here, and I'm helping out the church here. I'm, I'm helping out with, with uh, you know, Animals in need through SBCA, and I'm helping out with a, you know, community cleanups and along the ocean, along the beach. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm helping with different ministries and different organizations. And you know, working, working hard and honoring God isn't about a paycheck. We've had people on our staff here at Shoreline, who people who've worked full time for Shoreline, who haven't gotten paid a penny. They said, "I don't need the income. I just want to serve Jesus." And we brought people on our staff here at Shoreline. Right now, we have actually open staff positions. Right now. Uh, when they, we shouldn't have open staff positions. We have some great administrative positions at the church here that are open because right now there's a lot of people that are saying, I can make as much or more sitting at home than I could at work at a shoreline church. Why would, I, why would I work if I can sit at home and collect money for free? And I would say because I understand Scripture and God's invitation to meaning and purpose in life. But, but that's, that's, you know, we, we can live in a new way. We can count the cost of what it means to give ourselves to what God calls us to do with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. One last question. Am I committed to hard work as a gift from God and a witness to the world? Am I committed to understand that hard work is a gift from God, but also that the world sees how we live and how we work? Oh God, this is our prayer today. That we would come to understand the beauty and the gift of hard work. In a world that may not value it like it used to, in a world that sees things different than, uh, but but God, we don't don't base our lives, we don't base our worldview and our thinking on how the world functions. We base our thinking and our lives on your word and God, on your example through Jesus. And so help us pour ourselves out and pour ourselves into what honors you. Help us be a blessing wherever we are. Lord, whatever you have us, I pray for the students that are here that they will do their work as for you. I pray for dads and moms that are raising families. <coughs> that they will love their children and raise them in a way that honors you and do it for your glory. I pray for people in all walks of life and all different workplaces. Lord, that you would let them do what they do for your glory. And I pray for those people who right now are hearing in a way that is challenging their hearts to say, maybe I need to step back in and do some kind of work. Maybe I've been sitting for too long that you would help them find a great, meaningful place where they can labor and strive and work to be a blessing to others, but also find the joy of hard work that you give to each one of us who will follow your call. And I pray as a church for those people who are broken, who are hurting, who are unable to meet their own needs. May we as the church be the first ones to step up and love and care like Jesus. Let Let us show compassion in all that we do but also strive to honor you in all we do. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you just a couple quick invitations. If you've never been baptized and you want to be baptized, we have a class at 1 o'clock today online. Last week was the live class. This week is the online class. So all you have to do is text the word baptism right there to that number. And if you text the word baptism, what will happen right now, whether you're at home or here, you'll get a link to the class and you're in. All right, so if you want to learn about baptism and consider it, our next baptism is going to be uh, at the, at, in the ocean, and that's always, I think, our funnest baptism. I love doing ocean baptisms. And we also do some in here also, but this time it's going to be ocean baptisms. Also, if you want prayer, we have folks that will be up front here that would love to pray for you and pray with you. And if you're online, all you need to do is email your prayer, and we'll have, we have a team that prays very faithfully, very consistently. If you email the prayer or if you call the number on the screen, we will right away, somebody will answer that phone, unless they're praying with somebody else, and then just try again, and they'll pray with you on the phone. And if you're new at Shoreline, we want to give a warm welcome. If you're online and you're new, just text the word WELCOME 
to the number you see on the screen, and that word will pop up a link, and that's our way to connect with you and get to know you and answer your questions about Shoreline. And if you're here on our campus and you're new, just go by the Connection Center right through the lobby here or come in from outdoors to the lobby, and uh, we'll answer your questions, give you information, and just give you a warm welcome and a little gift bag, and thank you for coming. If you're able to stand, would you stand at home? Would you stand here in the worship center? Let's stand together. As we close this time together, may you walk and live in the presence of the God who gave everything for you. Walk in the name of Jesus who gave his life on the cross, who cared for the broken and the sick and the forgotten and the hurting, and who worked as the Father called him to work. And may you do all you do, not for human bosses, but would you do it for the glory of Jesus. And watch how he blesses others through your life and blesses you along the way. God bless you. Have a great week. And we'll be back here for the next message in the Forgotten Art series next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week.